there, there will be probably everyone who isn't a Bayern fan probably screaming into their phones being like yeah. when are these guys <laughs> going to talk about Leverkusen and, and the opportunity is now the time um, is now the time is now if you allow me some more hyperbole if you let me just sprinkle some more on this episode uh, Matt when I was watching the kind of post-match scenes of the players, the Leverkusen players going over to the ultras in Leverkusen and, you know, Herodeki in the stands with the microphone and Javi Alonso going over. It honestly felt to me a bit like, obviously it was a great moment, it's great advertising for the Bundesliga, you know, people will be looking at it and thinking, finally, here's a team who might challenge Bayern. But even if you just kind of narrow it into those football fans in that stadium, what a moment, what a historical moment. You know, they, they might not go on and win the title, they might do a typical Neverkusen thing, but at least everyone there that day will be able to say, I remember 15 years ago when Xabi Alonso was a head coach here, the whole world was watching and we absolutely thumped Bayern Munich. We made that, we made Bayern, the record meister, look like the most the most average team in Germany. That, to me, felt like something worth celebrating, not just for Leverkusen, but for the Bundesliga itself. Whatever happens by the end of the season, something changed last night in Leverkusen. I've I've been living in this part of Germany for almost eight years. Um, I go to watch Bayer Leverkusen very, very regularly. Admittedly, and with respect to Leverkusen, often for the opponents than for Bayer Leverkusen themselves, and I, I freely admit that. Uh, which doesn't you know doesn't excuse the fact that Leverkusen themselves also have often played very you know absolutely spectacular attacking football. You know they just don't defend. So it's always been a good laugh watching Bayer Leverkusen. It's been it's been entertaining. However, I've also been there in empty stadiums, half-empty Europa League group stage games. Leverkusen is, yeah, it's sandwiched in between Cologne, in between Dusseldorf, in between Schalke, Mönchengladbach, Dortmund. doesn't play a big role. It really doesn't. Um, something, I, 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 something changed last night. I've never heard, I've never heard an atmosphere like that of, uh, of Bayern Leverkusen. I've never heard noise like it. I wanted to ask Javi Alonso in the press conference... If that if he sensed a change, if something had changed, and I couldn't ask the question because the press room was too full and I didn't have a microphone, because there were one because there were one hundred and sixty accredited journalists, and like I've never seen that. I've been you going to Leverkusen games. Give some games context, for Matt, for <laughs> people who don't know the trade, like how many you think there usually are those kind of games. I'd, I mean, I'd suggest maximum thirty. Yeah, last time I was there, 40, if there were more than thirty, maybe. I'd be amazed. Yes, Fair. I mean, I walked, I, I walked into the the, the media, and again, I know little violins out. I walked to the media center at one and a half hours before kickoff. I couldn't get, I couldn't get a seat to sit down. <laughs> so uh, it was absolutely rammed. Um, I've never seen anything like. And then the there was a different, the whole different. Even before kickoff, there was a different atmosphere around the place. I was reading in the uh, the fanzine that the that the ultras brought out, and they had their introduction. You know, this is a time for a changing of the guard. It's quite it's obvious to anyone. We're the best team in this league. This is time to show it. German football needs it. We need it. Our city needs it. And if anyone's going to do it, why not us? You know, and the the stadium responded. The I, I glanced you know in the other direction after the goal of the 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 Nordkurve, the terrace behind behind the goal, and there were bodies dressed in carnival suits, so sort of different Marvel characters and Disney characters and animals and stuff flying everywhere. And it's, uh, I've, I've never heard, I never heard noise like it. Something, something changed last night. There's, there's some belief that this is, this is possible. Yeah, I saw a few Rudy Rollers in the crowd last night. Not just the one sitting next to Julian Nagelsmann, um, <laughs> due to carnival. Seb, I, I, I honestly don't think we could praise enough the tactical kind of victory that we saw here from Alonso. Of course, we talked about how you know Tuchel kind of made a lot of errors in this and his setup, and you know how Bayern maybe shot themselves in the foot but equally when we saw that starting 11 for Leverkusen and the fact that you know there's no there's no striker in the team Adley's playing up front Tell is in for Frimpong um, you know Andrik's in there instead of obviously Palacios is out injured and things like that I honestly thought Oh, you know, this, this, we've, we've seen this so many times before you know a last minute injury to the kind of title hope uh, contenders and it all comes crumbling down. It's almost always Dortmund. It's almost always revolves around the half fit Jude Bellingham or Erling Haaland being rushed back from some sort of surgery. Never quite works out. But in this case, it was actually Xabi Alonso, you know, playing some sort of tactical masterclass and clearly looked at how Barn have played this season and thought, 
well, I could stick Patrick Schick in there. I could try and park my team on the barn box like I've done with every other team, uh, or I, as I've done against every other opponent this season. But instead, I'm going to play the quick players. I'm going to use Florian Wurtz to play off them. Um, and they had so much success from it, didn't they? Yeah, there were, there were a couple of moments when, particularly in the first half when Adley went through on goal and he, he didn't take his chance, but you thought like his pace in itself just seemed to rattle and disturb Bayern um, straight away. Like I really liked the way that, yes, like Teller play, played predominantly from the right, but like I, I really liked his influence through the middle. Um, and there were little things all over the the, the, the lineup. Like I know that Eben Sober likes to play as a left-sided centre-back in a three rather than a two. Obviously he's playing on the right initially when they're in a four to start with and he played very very well um I, granite jack we've talked about an awful lot just his orchestrating work and how valuable is he is to the side i thought andrich was superb um like given the kind of what his limitations are perceived to be as a player um i thought he was extremely effective in the middle of the pitch um and verts i wrote on twitter before the game x sorry before the game in fact, I'm not doing that. I wrote on Twitter, not X, that I, my main hope was to see Foreign Vert show what a good player he is when so many new people who probably wouldn't watch German football week to week were watching. Um, and I feel like Alonso's great success was to put enough width into his side to allow Verse to dominate the middle of the pitch and play and orchestrate and play make in the way that you know he can do. And he looked the highest, the highest. Um, compliment I can pay him is that he looked like one of those interior players that Guardiola used at Barcelona. It looked like an Iniesta type uh, on Saturday night. I thought he was absolutely sensational. And such a great story because I, when you suffer an injury as serious as he did at that age, and you're a player who, because of the way he carries the ball, he invites contact so often um, that he's come back as a better player and has continued to evolve into what I think is how he's going to be worth um, goodness knows what um, by the time he eventually leaves Leverkusen but just a wonderful performance and creating the platform for him to operate within and really just to dice up Bayern was was Alonso's sort of um, great success uh, and yeah there's so many different things that go into that but then it's interesting to bring up the Dortmund thing because like you always feel those Dortmund games like you said they relied on um all the kind of the, the variables falling on Dortmund's side. So Bellingham being fit, for instance, or like uh, not having to drop Emery Chan in, into a centre-half position, all these little things. And if you look at Leverkusen, if you look at the side the Leverkusen um, sent out, there's all sorts of obstacles that Alonso had to navigate. Half-fit players. He lost Fringpong a few few weeks ago to, to that injury. He hasn't quite been fit since. I know he came on, but he hasn't quite been the same since. Um, uh, Tell has been integrated. Stanisic has become really important like these little things that are that in another coach's hands um become speed bumps haven't and yeah it's uh it was really nice to see because like you you couldn't help but have that sinking feeling when you when you saw the kind of the pieces drop out boniface having to go off to afcon um because sona go out go off to afcon as well because i to be honest like we, we haven't even mentioned him and he's one of the best players of the first three or four months of their season absolutely fantastic um so just great success and and huge like um a great moment for the alonso brand if that's not too much of a horrible uh phrase to use just because it shows kind of his uh i suppose his agility as a coach yeah he's turned he's turned negatives into into positives yeah. like i said the the the, uh, the big question before christmas was how a leverkusen could deal with some of the africa Cup of nations absentees and they had that sort of dress rehearsal game against against he Bochum, where, where he yeah, yeah. He, he intentionally left them all out and they still won four nil four one four nil off it um and yet he's yeah he's turned them into positives um the fact that he was i say fast in inverted commas to start with no out out striker in adley and, and teller yeah, had that double effect. First of all, obviously provided that issue with pace on the break that, that Bayern have, and that did prove to be an issue. But as you said, Seb, also opened up space for Verd to do whatever he wanted in midfield. So he had that double positive. So he's turned one, yeah, what you think is a negative on paper into two double positive effects. Um, yeah, g genius coaching. I, I did wonder before the first goal whether Leverkusen were going to maybe pay for the lack of clinicalness um, the perhaps Schick would have brought or Boniface had he been fit would have brought because a couple of chances did go begging 
when I think first of all uh, Teller capitalising that a Pamecano mistake and then the chance went back in uh, Adley in the build to the goal obviously a Pamecano got back and managed to clear uh, but obviously immediately after that they've taken the lead and the, the game changes but I did wonder whether they were a little bit profligate in the first sort of 15 15 20 minutes but um, yeah obviously yeah didn't prove to be an issue in the long term I wonder if like because one of the things that I, I I love uh, the range of Boniface's like contribution like you can drop him into a number 10 role and does pretty creative things with the ball I wouldn't say he's the most clinical player in in front of goal like he's he's someone that will have a few chances before he scores but then maybe that conditions you as a side to think, okay, well, we'll just keep creating, keep creating. We're not going to live and die off that one chance that we need to take and, you know, that's over. I mean, like, Boniface probably should have won the game in Munich um, back in back in September, or say August, September, whenever it was. Like, he had a couple of chances where, like, I think a player who'd been at the club a little bit longer probably wouldn't have snapped into the chance that he did. But, yeah, like... Uh, it's just a great footballing performance. Like if you if you look at the sort of the the construction of the goals, they all come from slightly different situations. Obviously, the third one is an anomaly, um, a wonderful one, like just ridiculous. But um, both goals are completely different. And actually, like to to take it full circle, like for Tuchel to say, well, no one saw the goal coming from there. Well, yeah, but then that's the virtue of it, isn't it? Because all your your chance creation becomes quite organic. To the point where you don't have like, these circuits in your football these mechanisms that you fall back on again and again and again to create chances, you you kind of ad hoc your way through it because you have enough gifted footballers on the pitch at the same time. And, that's... and that is a, that is exactly what Thomas Muller was complaining exactly about that. in his interview post post when he was complaining about having that, yeah, somehow in their Circuit heads, football. that mental lack of freedom to be able to play, whether that is down to players on the pitch or in you know, subconscious dig at, at Tuchel, as we said. Yeah, it's, a, it's an yeah. interesting comment. I think, it's just um, a thought as well that that third goal when when Frimpong has it on on the right, I can't. Maybe it's not too big a too big a deal because it, they were already two 0 down. It was the fifth minute of injury time. But Manuel Neuer's walking back, jogging. He, so he's certainly not sprinting. Uh, some you know there were several Bayern players who were sprinting. Manuel Neuer wasn't among them. And I was just yeah. I thought that I, I, I felt like before Frimpong hits it. So yeah, I felt it. Yeah, I felt like the guy off the corner uh, yeah. like. I was having a conversation with someone earlier today where I said, well, if you're a Bayern Munich goalkeeper like, and or if you're a Bayern Munich player and you know the club's history, you understand that weird stuff happens like in short periods of time at the end of games. And you know, ultimately, when full-time goes, you've won because you're a Bayern Munich player. I get it from that perspective, but it felt like a kind of him inserting himself into the game. I found it a bit late, yeah. When I saw him go up, I thought, uh, if this was maybe three or four minutes earlier, yeah. Now it seems a bit pointless, and then also what he said, he goes up for the header with Jonathan Tarr and loses it outright. Absolutely no chance. Jonathan Tarr does absolutely, absolutely he doesn't. I mean, clears the ball yeah. it's so he such ease. He was also great finish. He, yeah. he was also from incredibly points. composed the entire game. He has a few passes. He hits straight out of the pitch when he's trying Being to fly like the ball. Back, I feel yeah. Stefan. Like yeah, he's, he's yeah, yeah absolutely. I think you could even and yeah. I wonder just to be defend Neuer a little bit. Yeah, you're right. He has been a bit dodgy, dodgy since he came back from injury. But then again, and maybe it's not the best comparison. I've just been watching United on Sunday evening now, and Onana's doing you know, making the same issues. I wonder if it's a bit of a a general footballing thing of goalkeepers being forced to play out from the back all the time, and it's all like little set piece situations where the goalkeeper's waiting, and you've got two or three forwards waiting to press, and they're having to find that set piece way out. Yeah, maybe just a little bit of defence for Neuer there. But yeah, some of his passes were absolutely wayward. Just to bring it back to Leverkusen before we wrap up, um, I, the only things I wanted to add as well was that to add to what you said, Sam, about the brilliance of Florian Verts, um, in that first game, actually, the thing that I really took away from that was that, of course, Bayern kind of sucker punched them at the start with that Harry Kane goal, which, you know, you've never scored an easier goal than that. But as the game went on, I felt like Leverkusen were controlling the game more and more and more. As you said, Boniface could have won it. But the thing that really stood out to me was that Florian Verts just had the absolute freedom of that Bayern half from large chunks of that game and that was obviously when we're in the midst of Joshua Kimmich is in the number six he didn't know defensive midfielder and that was clear for all to see and going into this game you know I was I was saying that this game will be won or lost on whether Bayern have learned that lesson and whether they have some way of stopping Florian Wurtz and admittedly when I saw Eric Dyer in the lineup I thought okay he's going to play Dyer as that kind of holding midfielder and you know he's not the best player in the world but that is his trade his trade is to be the player of the base midfield and kind of get in the way of those passes and things obviously didn't work out at all and 
again, Vert's just... And now this isn't just because Bayern were poor, it's obviously because he's such a brilliant player and he's such an outstanding exploiter of space, if you will, but he just had so much space in this game time and time and time again. And, you know, there's a lot of people... The, the, the natural comparison to to Jamal Musiala it was right there in front of us all, and two different players and two different circumstances, obviously. But where where Musiala had been completely crowded out by a really impressive Leverkusen defence, Bayern almost just to the point of neglect, just completely almost ignored the fact that Florian Wurtz was just drifting in and out of that final third with no one keeping an eye on him at all. Yeah, I felt a little bit sorry for Musiala because I feel like. Uh, they're not quite the same player in my mind. Like they, they, they do different things to an extent, but like they're an example. Their form at the moment and the season generally is an example of what happens when, you know, depending on what's happening around you. So, like Leverkusen brought a really well-oiled group of players into that side. A lot of players who are playing right at the top of their form. Uh, we've mentioned some of the absence uh, absentees, but um, Grimaldo, Jacker, uh, even Nathan Teller after a few games. Um, these are players playing the best football of their career. Um, Verts has every reason to to kind of be included there as well. Um, Jonathan Tarr is his kind of renaissance has been an amazing thing actually uh, under Alonso. That's been one of the the, the, the great stories. at Leverkusen, um, Musiala, like what is from a Bayern Munich perspective? What is the uh, what is the dynamic that you trust within that team? What is the thing that you expect to see to work really really well? Like there isn't really a thing there. Like. There are there's sort of fragments of footballing chemistry between uh, Sané and Kane, and um, when he was in the side, Davis and Kane. Um, but the entire year has been built around let's try this guy here, and we're not we're going to have an argument about what this player does and what his role can be and what his limitations are. And when you chuck a Musiala into that and expect him to be a difference maker, maybe you get away with it against Darmstadt or maybe a, a kind of um, I was going to say Dortmund, <laughs> but sorry, Stefan, I saw your face. I'm going to do it to you. <laughs> um, you get my point, though. Like they're yeah, two, they're, they're two of players. Lighties. Yeah, but they're, they're two players who exist in entirely different situations at the moment. And you're kind of like versus profits. Musiala suffers, uh, and like if ever a game proved it, it's kind of Saturday, unfortunately, for Musiala. Who I, I felt like again taking the aim at the people who dropped into the Bundesliga for the first time all year and had a go at Musiala and kind of um, dismissed him as a myth. No, he's a fantastic footballer. It, every bit as good as Florian Verts in my mind and will have every bit as bright a future, but it's in a team at the moment which just doesn't suit him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which I guess brings us back to Thomas Tuchel, which we've already covered. So, uh, Matt, any final parting uh, work pearls of wisdom uh, before we wrap things up? Uh, no, just the the look the look going forward. I think is where where Leverkusen go now. You know, thirteen games to go, five points clear. Um, still a really an awful long way to go. Thirty nine points to play for. If my very dodgy maths is correct. Um, and yeah, history perhaps speaks against them because of, you know the the, the history of two thousand two and you know new, uh, acquiring that. Moniker of Neverkusen and, and and never having won the Bundesliga before. Anyway, being in a completely new position, that all speaks against it. You know, can they now deal with that pressure? It's going to be week in, week out now. It's going to be almost like a countdown, almost. Like, you know, at, at, at what point can they make it certain? At what point can they win it? Um, they've also got you know two other fronts to keep fighting on. Still in the you know, in the German Cup in the semi final against uh, Dusseldorf the, in the Europa League. Which I, where I suspect that Alonso will want to make good that semi final defeat to, to Roma last year as well. So it might depend on where, you know, where key Europa League fixtures fall in comparison to, to key Bundesliga fixtures around that. Um, on the other hand, I, you know, current form, I can't think of a single Bundesliga team who's going to who's going to trouble them. Uh, you think on uncertain form, the trip away to Dortmund is a trouble, is, is a problematic one. Um, Dortmund are well, their actual you know, actual better performances this week and the win against Freiburg. I can you, know, you can potentially see a situation there where that's a that's a, a stumbling block. Having said that though, so many things are in Leverkusen's favour now that weren't in Borussia Dortmund's favour, particularly given the size of the club, and that's where them being a lot smaller than Dortmund plays into their hands. There isn't that there isn't that intense local pressure 
let alone intense nationwide or even global pressure, um, which Borussia Dortmund might have felt. There's not that pressure of having been challenges to to buy in for the past five or six, seven years and find out to do it. That, that, Leverkusen don't have that pressure. There's no intense media spotlight on Bayer Leverkusen. If you want to read any top interviews or exclusive stuff about Leverkusen, you don't. There is no base. There is no dedicated Leverkusen newspaper. You, all everything appears in the in in the Cologne or Dusseldorf press. Um, Leverkusen absolutely do have a dedicated, very community based, hardcore support. Of course, it exists. It absolutely does exist. Um, but it's nowhere near on the scale of what surrounds Borussia Dortmund or Schalke or Cologne or Gladbach. So they don't have they won't they're not they won't deal with it with any of that. They can operate in a calm environment, keep doing their thing, away from the spotlight from week to week. And I think it speaks ultimately in very much in their favour. Yeah. I think there's the temptation to draw comparisons last season where Dortmund obviously kind of surged to the to the front of the queue and then tripped up at the final spot. But I guess uh, the difference here maybe, and maybe it's not a difference, maybe this was the same last year, but as much as I can see Leverkusen dropping points this season, I just feel like Bayern are more than capable of dropping more. I think that's the difference between Bayern of three or four years ago and this Bayern team. You always get There's, there's always been clubs who have pulled ahead at certain points of the season, but there's, there was always an inev- inevitability that Bayern would get their house in order and just blitz the rest of the season. I just don't get the impression that Bayern are going to be able to kind of tighten the ship and wait for Leverkusen to drop points to capitalise on it. 100%, because that, that's the assumption, isn't it, that Bayern Munich are going to run the table. I, mean, I, I can't see that happening at all. Also, that Borussia Dortmund side last season was an individual-led team. Like, you know, the tenor of its performance were dictated by high-performing individuals, whereas Leverkusen are a system-based side. Yeah, they have really influential players within that, but they are about the system as Saturday and I proved. And so like an injury, a lack of fitness, uh, being stretched by uh, demands of like continental and cup football, it's not going to impact them in quite the same way either. So like, I, I, I can't like either the Dortmund game is tricky when they go there, that of course it will be, that'll be an occasion and it's something to look forward to you. But uh, I don't know where they're going to drop five points and I don't expect, you know, I, I, I think they'll have to drop more than that for Bayern to catch them. Um, and I don't see where that's going to happen. So um, I'm not going to tempt fate by saying it's done, but um, they're, they're not just a favourite now. They're a heavy, heavy favourite. Yeah. I well, uh, t- just if, if I can finish with a quick analogy, I think if last season was two two tortoises going, uh, racing for the finish line. Falling over season, each other. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> this 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 season, um, yeah, it really is a case of the tortoise and the, the hare, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Is, that, is it um, a hare? I think it it's is a yeah. hare. Yeah, yeah hap- but in, yeah. in that analogy, the tortoise wins. So <laughs> yeah. I'm not quite sure. Oh, good who. point. The, the hair yeah. gets cocky, yeah. like it just it stops <laughs> and it like it has something to eat, has a bit of sleep, yeah. and you it's know. Good point. I've not thought know, that through, but yeah, the yeah. plucky little Bayern Munich just keeps going. 